We are live. We are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Fire in Chicago. Hey, Chris. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's a nice uh, 75 degrees and sunny today. So You've, you've moved your that. camera position there. I have. The studio has shifted. I wanted you to see my, my wall art. Fantastic. Yeah. And so, um, you know, is something likely to leap out from behind that curtain? Uh, no. Okay. Well, our guest, I, our guest, our guest, our guest is going to leap out from behind the curtain. That is going to be an amazing moment. <laughs> so, uh, well, we'll wait a moment for people to join us, and we hope people will uh, uh, sign in and say hi and tell us where you're watching from. Um, and we're here talking to you about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours and Facebook pages. And, of course, all of our uh, programs are archived on the uh, webpage for History Happy Hour, which is on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours website. So, Chris, who do we have uh, watching with us today? We have Marcus and, uh, uh, from Florida, Valerie in Normandy, um, James again. Okay. Doreen, of course. Tony. Excellent. Ted Moon. Ted Moon. I'm yeah. going to give a shout out to Ted Moon in a moment. He's our, he's our, our roving photographer. I know. It's uh, awesome to have one. Uh, Bob and Lizzie and uh, uh, others who are joining us uh, as we go along here. So um, I guess we should probably, we have enough folks uh, with us now to get do underway and right. to do you know what. To do what? What? I don't know. Is there a tune, a catchy tune that would bring the audience in? Maybe so. <laughs> Boom, the bar is open. Hey. And I found the bell, so that's <laughs> Finally. good. So um, the Eisenhower Memorial was dedicated in Washington, D.C. on Thursday night, and we have some great pictures here, uh, many of which were taken by Ted Moon last night, and he sent them to us. And the memorial's on a four-acre park across Independence Avenue from the Air and Space Museum. Uh, and it depicts Ike at various times in his life, starting out with... Uh, Eisenhower as a boy, young boy in Kansas, uh, Eisenhower as the general in World War II, and of course he commanded the D-Day invasion in uh, 1944, um, Eisenhower as president, and he was president from 1953 to 1961, just a little history lesson there for anybody who's forgotten. And in the background, you may have noticed this background, this is a um, drawing by uh, Frank Geary who designed the uh, monument. Uh, that is supposed to represent the uh, Pont, Pont du Hoc, the cliffs at Pont du Hoc. Uh, and I'm told that it looks kind of uh, ordinary in the daytime, but you can certainly see that it's yeah, pretty dramatic. spectacular looking at night. Yeah. Um, so with this memorial open, what a fitting and wonderful time to talk about uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and we have the perfect guest for such an occasion. Uh, Susan Eisenhower is one of four of uh, Ike's grandchildren. She is a consultant author and a Washington, D.C.-based policy strategist. I wasn't sure I could say all those words in a row, Susan, <laughs> but I, I, I got them out. Uh, with many decades of work on national security issues, and she is the author of a new book called How Ike Led, about the principles of Eisenhower's leadership. Susan, welcome to History Happy Hour. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. And Thanks, we, we hope you brought a cocktail with you. It I is did. it is happy hour, so it we'll say hour, yeah. there Cheers. you go. Cheers to you. Cheers. And we'll have a good talk. So this uh, the memorial is twenty years in the making, and there was some controversy along the way. Um, so I've lost fine. Sound. Uh, she's lost sound. Can you hear us at all, Susan? I can't hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Yeah. It's always <laughs> exciting. You know, there's never a dull moment on History Happy Hour. <laughs> so what's your what's your uh, take on the memorial now that it's finally up? Well, I, I think it's just great. I really do. The original design had a lot of things going on in it, uh, um, uh, numerous pillars, and uh, I think there were three screens originally, and there was so much going on, uh, it seemed um, hard to understand what exactly the uh, central theme was. Uh, in any case, uh, after, you know, a fairly lengthy period of time, but fairly short in terms of how long it takes to get a memorial built. 
uh, we came to a decision that um, perhaps the theme should shift from young Ike looking at his future and the, uh, the, the prairies of Kansas to something more monumental. And it was great that so many of us who had qualms about each other's views got together and we decided on the beaches of Normandy in peacetime which from my perspective is, is um, much more appropriate given Eisenhower's uh, role during World War II. And then of course the, the presidency, which is uh, characterized by eight years in office. Well, glad, glad that it's up. Too bad that it rained on uh, Thursday night at that dedication, but uh, excited about the next chance I'm gonna have to go to Washington to well, see it. Yeah, I was just thinking that the rain reminded me a little bit of uh, what was happening at Shafe headquarters just before <laughs> yeah. the decision to launch uh, D-Day because, uh, you know, they, they made, uh, Eisenhower made that decision with the pouring rain um, on the basis that there was going to be an opening next day when the, um, the assault would actually take place. Um, Susan, I wanted to start, since the book is about leadership, um, there's a great quote right at the beginning of the book, and I'm going to read this. Um, uh, from someone else who's kind of a giant of, of American history, uh, George Marshall. And he's written, writing to Eisenhower in May of 1945, and he says, um, you've made history, great history for the good of all mankind, and you, do, you have stood for all we hope for and admire in an officer in the U.S. Army. These are my tributes, and with them I send my personal thanks. So first of all, I guess for Marshall, that's pretty high praise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but, but what are those qualities that he saw in Eisenhower that Eisenhower performed so well as kind of a lead into talking about Eisenhower as a leader? Well, before the war, as you probably know, George Marshall had to jump over many more senior officers to uh, come up with Eisenhower as the uh, commander, uh, first of American forces in Europe and then Supreme Allied Commander. And there were a couple of things he really liked about Eisenhower. Uh, one of them is that uh, he could delegate to him, and Eisenhower was willing to um, take take the bull by the horns and to uh, advance uh, a strategy and uh, be ready to um, take the the fall and accept responsibility for whatever the outcome. And you know, one of the things that George Marshall has to worry about, of course, is the fact that he's got a two front war. And he just doesn't have time to be micromanaging. So if, if not for a figure like Eisenhower, who uh, was capable of uh, managing and, and advancing uh, the goals he'd been given, uh, it'd be hard to know how George Marshall would have pulled off the, um, the ultimate victory. Yeah. I think also, if I could say one other thing, is that uh, Eisenhower had almost, uh, uh, I mean, a wonderful capacity to bring people together. And of course, the biggest challenge was to keep the alliance uh, together Absolutely. because as as, as uh, nostalgic as we are for those days, uh, truthfully, there were a lot of disagreements uh, at headquarters about strategy, about um, resource allocation, and all the other things commanders have to worry about. And it took a special diplomatic skill. As a matter of fact, uh, just in closing, I'd say in my book, I said I thought he was a, uh, a genius of knowing when to deploy his ego and when to suppress it. Right. <laughs> Which is um, probably a rare quality amongst other senior allied commanders at that. Uh... Well, it, it may be a fairly uh, rare quality in general because yeah. uh, certainly today everybody wants to win every fight, even small ones, big ones, the ones in between. But I learned something from researching that book is that you got to choose your fights. Uh, and then you have to know uh, you have to also have an idea of which ones are the big ones and which ones are the small ones. So uh, that's what I try and cover in the book. Well, something you said that that I really that really struck me, uh, you know, talking uh, following up on Chris's question is that Eisenhower. Uh, I don't know if he said this or if it's your take on him that he didn't want to be the loudest voice in the room. He wanted to be the calmest voice in the room. Well, that's a great quote by Robert Farrell, who was the editor of the Eisenhower Diaries. So if anybody knew just about every word that had been uttered by <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, it was Farrell. But, you know, he, um, he was a person who studied the behavior of others. And I think actually, in looking back on it, it didn't even occur to me until the book was done, is that this really informed absolutely everything. He had a philosophy about human nature, and he watched people. 
Uh, by the way, um, he was a great diarist, so if anybody wants to really get to know him in an uh, up-close and personal way, uh, these diaries can make pretty exciting reading. And uh, in the 1920s, when he was at, um, working for Douglas MacArthur, uh, he wrote a wonderful chapter called Notes on Men. And in this chapter, he describes the strengths and weaknesses of the people he reported to. And it's fascinating what he flags as being really positive characteristics uh, and which ones he flags for being um, uh, very uh, tenuous in terms of uh, leadership qualities. Well, it's all, you know, it was interesting you say that because I was, I was getting ready for this. I was going through some of my old notes and he actually was doing this while he was in school. I mean, I guess there are <laughs> school books from high school where he's, he's grading his teachers as he's going along saying, you know, this one's got it or this one's off the mark or you know, <laughs> the notes to himself, but he's, Right. He's assessing people as he's... Well, one of the fun things is he didn't like the way uh, Douglas MacArthur lost his temper. So he's got a whole section in there on, on how people um, blow their tops. And, <laughs> and, and he took note of how it made him feel, so he tried very hard not to do that himself. And since he was a very passionate, emotional person, he um, wrote it down instead of sharing his uh, strong feelings with others. But... Uh, he did say that Douglas MacArthur, in this particular uh, chapter called Notes on Men, said that MacArthur was a genius at, um, at expressing clear instructions. And that's, that's a really interesting thing, because we know how many uh, leaders we have uh, who aren't very clear in their own minds yeah. and make it very, very tough for the followers. Yeah. Um, you just said something there that... Um, quite striking. You said that uh, Ike was um, very passionate and emotional. And I have to tell you, Susan, I don't think that's the view that comes through the history books. And I don't think that's the view that too many people, if you said passionate and emotional, I don't think too many people go, oh, it's Eisenhower. Uh, <laughs> it, it, that, that's a very striking observation. Oh, well, he was. I mean, these diaries. Um, oh, the, the Philippine diaries that I keep, he, he, he notes in the diaries that uh, he's keeping this diary so that he can be sure that of the people who are going crazy around him, that it's not him. And, um, <laughs> and then he, he blows off steam throughout this uh, diary, which is just wonderful. But if you read his personal letters, and especially letters to uh, Mamie Eisenhower, um, you know, his wife, my grandmother, um, you know, he ends um, a letter in 19... Um, 43, where he's at um, the front, and he writes to her about their marriage, and he signs it. I've, I've, I actually own the copy of this. I own the, own the letter, and it's really one of my most prized possessions because it's all about how she should think about his demise, that if he goes out in this war, she uh, should not be sad that she still has time to uh, love someone else. And then... Um, and then he tells her how proud he is of her and uh, how much he loves her and how much he loves my father, who was the only uh, of the two boys they had, the surviving son. And then he ends the letter, your lover for all these years. Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I like that. I'm waiting for somebody to write something like that to me. So, yeah. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> oh, um, Susan, wow. you know, I, one of the... Um, guest we've had earlier on the show was Andrew Roberts, and he was talking about his Churchill book. Um, and I, I was watching an interview he did just recently here in London, uh, and he was talking about his book about leadership in wartime. Uh, and he talks about Churchill and Napoleon and Margaret Thatcher, and there's a whole host of characters, and, and Eisenhower, of course. Um, and the, the interviewer asks him, says, um, well, of all these people, who would you want to be at a dinner with? Who would you sit down with at dinner? Uh, and Ra Robert says, well, I would like them all in the room, um, but of course I'd want to sit next to Churchill and Napoleon because they have such outsized personalities and they, you know, be interesting to listen to and <laughs> on and on and on. And the interviewer then says, well, but you mentioned Eisenhower was at the dinner too, and he kind of got a grin on his face and said, well, he was the quiet one who listened, um, which I thought was interesting. And it, it caused me to think, how does somebody of his disposition deal with, with these outsized personalities like Churchill, you know, and so effectively? Well, um, I, I'll um, answer that 
in a minute if I may tell you a wonderful anecdote that's in, in the book, and it, it comes to uh, uh, me through uh, a suggestion made by a, a scholar. Oh, read that, uh, read that chapter about uh, Ike's uh, time at Columbia University. So when, uh, after the war, uh, he uh, became uh, chief of staff of the Army, and then he retired and went to, uh, as president to Columbia University. And the faculty there just really, you know, weren't sure uh, yeah. that there was going to be a uh, military leader. And they, I don't know what um, academia thinks about military leaders, like they uh, aren't supposed to have a brand in their heads or something. I don't know. But um, a president of Columbia University, Eisenhower, gets invited to um, the history faculty annual dinner. And it was suggested that he could do what he wanted to, but he was very welcome to just sit and listen. And what I think the faculty was unprepared for is that Ike was passionately interested in history from the time as uh, he was a little kid. He was so interested in history, his mother had to lock up his history books so that he would just go do his chores. And uh, in any case, uh, at the very end of the evening, the academics all start talking among themselves about why didn't um, uh, General, uh, wh why didn't uh, the Allies uh, get to uh, achieve uh, victory by going uh, th uh, around the soft underbelly of Europe. Um, this was something often discussed. And then, <laughs> completely unprepared, um, Ike gets up and gives a, he was being quiet, but he couldn't stand it any longer, obviously, <laughs> so he got up and gave a 10-minute dissertation on the so-called soft underbelly of Europe including going all the way back to Philip of Macedonia and working his way up through the history, and then went into the terrain and why, from a military strategic point of view, you would not want to go that route. And they were overcome. The history department's overcome, and all started clapping. <laughs> um, well, so actually, uh, as the segue there, the soft underbelly of Europe was, of course, one of the things that Churchill, he had some very um, interesting desires to get out of where we were and to be um, moving east. As a matter of fact, uh, at some point he has, he starts talking about trying to bring Turkey into the war and, yeah. and other things. And um, so they did have uh, some strategic differences, but I have to say that the, the two men uh, not only respected each other, but had, you know, really developed a very, very close, even emotional relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and we can be reminded of that when we go back and listen to Ike's eulogy um, at Winston Churchill's funeral. It, you remember, goodbye, yeah. old friend. It's yeah. it's a very, very, and and few people realize that it was Ike who was on the fundraising committee that erected um, Winston Churchill's statue in Washington D.C. Mm. And get this, left a time capsule in it. Oh, wouldn't oh. you like to know what's Isn't that in there? Fun? Wow. Or maybe you do. You know what? My grandfather loved time capsules. He was yeah. completely mad about them, and I think they were <laughs> quite popular at the time. But he's got a yeah. time capsule in um, uh, in the study uh, at the Gettysburg Farm wow. that he wrote to be opened in uh, 2055. Wow. I, yeah. I have I have to say, apropos of nothing, and this is just uh, it, it's. It, People who watch this show expect me to mention the Ghost Army at some point during every show. Please, please do. Um, but there was a, a, a gentleman in this uh, World War II deception unit, the Ghost Army, named Gil Seltzer, and he was the architect for this auditorium in uh, in New York, in Utica, New York, beautiful downtown Utica, New York. And uh, they put a time capsule in when they built it, and then they opened the time capsule 50 years later, and they looked at this picture and so who's in this picture? Oh, that's the architect. And they looked him up to like see when he died or see what the information was like. And he was still alive uh, oh because Gil Seltzer's 106 years old. I guess I'm sorry. I'm exaggerating. 106 next month. But, um, you know, that it's like the guy in the time capsule lived. <laughs> they didn't bury it long enough. Well, I told my kids they better be there for the ceremony when it's open because I don't think I'm going to make it. And oh. uh, so, no, uh, there was a... Uh, in this particular case, it was a hundred-year time capsule, and yeah, who knows what's in it. But wouldn't it be fascinating to know whether any of it has relates to his wartime comrades, or whether oh, he's? Right. My guess is that it's uh, a lot of it's about the future. So, yeah. so probably, about... it's probably not going to be okay. So now, here's what I really think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. 
everybody's dead and now I'm going to get my say. That Montgomery guy. Ooh. <laughs> Um, Susan, your book is filled with uh, many interesting things, uh, and talking to you is really fascinating, and partly because you approach this with a wonderful twin perspective of someone, first of all, who is a, you're a dreaded Washington insider, right? Oh, dear. Yeah, I know. Uh, but then you're also someone with uh, both a personal relationship with uh, President Eisenhower, who was alive, who died when you were 18 or 19, yes. I guess. yeah. Um, and someone who had a lot of entree to to people who worked with him, which you talk about in the book and oh. their points of view. And so that really, I think, gives you a, a unique perspective on this. I want to swing back to um, to D-Day for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and because even with two terms as president, I think D-Day is still one of Eisenhower's great moments, if not yep. his greatest triumph. Um, and very famously, as I probably most of our viewers know, uh, Eisenhower wrote out a communique and stuck it in his pocket on June 5th, although he wrote July 5th on the bottom of the note, uh, as to what he was going to say if the invasion uh, didn't work. Uh, our landings in the Cherbourg harve area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold. Uh, my decision to attack was based on the best information available. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Um, and I, this has often been brought up as kind of il illustrative of Eisenhower's leadership, and I think rightly so. So tell us a little bit about it, and also the fact that Eisenhower was reluctant for this to be preserved for history. Well, it is. It's an interesting uh, story. So um, Captain Harry Butcher was Ike's naval aide and uh, assigned to be the headquarters diarist. And uh, in July, uh, he was going to collect up relevant papers for this diary that uh, Butcher kept. And he said, do you have anything, anything at all about this invasion? I'm, I'm ad-libbing a little because we don't, of course, know the full conversation. Uh, but Ike says, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I guess the only thing I haven't mentioned to you is that I, you know, had a unwritten, I had a, a communique I wrote, and Harry Butcher wanted to see it. And he looks at this thing and says, oh, my gosh, I want to keep that. And Ike says, um, well, no, I, I'd, I'd like to just keep it private. You know, there's no reason we didn't have to use it. And uh, I think the, the crazy thing is that Eisenhower didn't understand the historic importance of it. So Harry Butcher says, well, d um, put the date down, in other words, uh, so that we can identify this as, um, you know, your communique on June 5th. And I, because it was July and was a little bit annoyed that <laughs> uh, Butcher wanted this uh, <laughs> uh, communique for his files, that he writes July down. And anyway, that's the reason for the July. But he finally let uh, Butcher take it. And to Butcher's credit, he did put it with the other papers. Um, he didn't uh, auction it or he didn't keep it for his family members. Um, and so it um, was presented along with all the other papers to the Eisenhower Library many years ago. But I, I had carried one of those uh, communiques for every one of um, the major military operations. Um, but it's very clear, uh, it was clear to me because we've discussed this as a family, but you know, he also carried it for himself. Um, so he, you know, would resist the temptation uh, to get up and say things that, uh, he just wanted to make himself clear in his own head and to everybody else. And of course, as you know, the decision is his alone. Um, he was including uh, taking responsibility for the weather forecast, uh, which was very dicey as we all remember. Um, and he had already taken full responsibility for the perilous drop, airborne drop. Um, so at the end of the day, all those were his decisions, nobody else's, and he was ready to admit that should things go wrong. Well, it, it speaks to not only, to me, it speaks to not only the willingness to take responsibility, it also speaks to um, something that Chris and I were talking about before, preparation. 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 So we're going to prepare for if it works, and we're going to prepare for if it doesn't work, and I'm going to be prepared. Yeah. Well, that's right. And th the thing is, is you don't want to get caught flat-footed. Let's say something had happened, 
Uh, nobody is ever at their best in the middle of a, um, an unfolding crisis. They might be at their best after the crisis or before the crisis, but when things are unfolding, um, you know, it's a distraction not to have thought through what you're going to say under every scenario. And let me just say, I got this in spades as a kid. I mean, he was a great contingency planner. And I think if I've inherited anything from him, it's um, I'm a pretty good contingency planner myself. Um, I'm always, always um, thinking about three and four scenarios and what I'm going to do in uh, each case. And um, I don't know how that got drilled in, but it did, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it, it, what really struck me is, you know, obviously I had heard of the, the note story and, and it's become one of those great tales of D-Day. Um, but one of the things I learned about in your book was that he did this every time. Yeah. So this isn't just because of this one moment. This is just part of how he leads. It's part of his character that he's always ready to accept responsibility. Right? Well, this isn't just the one off. The, the other invasions of, uh, you know, in North Africa and Sicily, they were all the largest of their time. Absolutely. It's just that the D-Day ends up being even larger than the other two. So a lot of very, um, I'm not going to say experimental because that sounds like this is an experiment. No, it isn't. We were trying to win the war. Um, but they were doing things that hadn't been done for the first time, including um, um, putting together uh, uh, a unified command uh, at all echelons of British and Americans and other allies. That you know, We hadn't fought wars like that uh, right. on an integrated personnel basis. Um, and when he becomes supreme commander, he's actually commanding for the first time um, the Air Force, the Navy, and, and the Armed Forces. Um, I mean, the infantry and others who uh, get off those landing craft and storm the beaches. So um, there was a lot of new things that were coming along, and each one of them, you know, could have gone south, uh, but but uh, they, they didn't. And so that's, I, I'm sure that was, you know, also a factor. You shut me off. It's me. Oh. I muted myself yeah. to keep all the, the noises of the farm animals out of the, Oh, it says farm animals. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in an apartment <laughs> building on South Michigan Avenue. Um, I said, Chris, do you want to keep well, going? Well, no, I, I, you, you know, know, one of the other things is, is kind of general history, popular history about the war is that, well, you know, Ike was just the guy that smiled a lot and he was a really great personality <laughs> and he got all these generals to do these things, but it was really them doing the fighting and he's just right. kind of keeping the team together. Um, and I don't know if you came across anything where he kind of talked about this either to himself or to close associates because you know one of the things that I've kind of come to learn as I've studied him is uh, as a military man he's, he's brilliant and it's 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 much more than he just keeps these guys on point I mean you know as soon as he's given command of D-Day largest command in military history you know he goes to, to Churchill and he says okay great I'll do it but I command everything Right. Every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, boat. He and he gets it, and he's one of the only people that can look past the the inner service rivalry and the competing ego, all of this, to say no. This is how this has to be. Well, Chris, when you think about it, and I, I make this point in the beginning of my book, he was a strategic leader, not an operational leader. Right. And the job of a strategic leader is to integrate. Uh, all the various factors that bring an operation um, into some kind of cohesive whole. And that's why he was insistent on, um, you know, commanding everything, because it could be, you could get into a situation where some kind of quick decision had to be made where you would um, ramp up um, an infantry operation or ramp up tactical bombing or something like that, and to be going then back into... Uh, the bureaucratic politics of service right. rivalries uh, could have jeopardized the effort. Right. Uh, um, but all that was new, and he put his job on it. And I think the other, by the way, on Normandy, the other uh, big thing that was very important, and I think some historians have given Montgomery credit for it, but not according to the sources I read anyway, and that is um, he insisted on enlarging the invasion force. Right. Um, and Utah Beach becomes his... Um, you know, his requirement uh, to do that job plus uh, widening uh, Omaha Beach. And because we are, the American objective, of course, was um, 
Cherbourg, and we had to make a pivot to Cherbourg um, within a certain timeline, and we just didn't feel it was going to be possible without uh, Utah Beach. That's where the paratroopers come in. All right. So all of these uh, are um, integrated factors that then you know culminate in a we go or we don't go right. uh, today kind of thing. And this is not so. Um, the reason I thought it was important is that of the, of the carping that goes on during the war, and there was plenty of it in people's memoirs and the rest of it. These are subordinates complaining about uh, the boss didn't give me enough resources right, or the right. boss didn't give me enough authority. And I would say that any corporate leader would certainly uh, understand what that's like to have, um, you know, the director of marketing wishing right. that the advertising budget was bigger and, uh, you know, somebody else doing whatever. So uh, there isn't really a huge school for strategic leadership studies. Um, there is one, but it's not a huge one. And... Uh, I just thought it was really interesting to point out. Uh, that's why Marshall's uh, comments in the beginning are very important because Marshall was his boss. Right. And maybe his subordinates didn't always like what was going on, but it was working for Marshall. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an interesting parallel that occurred to me as you were talking um, um, uh, you know, with, with Eisenhower and General uh, Ulysses Grant. He may be the closest... Um, we have to someone like Eisenhower, and they're different, obviously, in, in some obvious ways. But what I was thinking about was that as, as Grant sets out in 1864 uh, uh, to what, what will be the beginning of the final offensive in the Eastern Theater of the Civil War, he sends a note to uh, President Lincoln in which he basically uh, obliterates all possible excuses. He basically says, well, you've given me everything I could ask for. Um, so we're all set, and uh, and if it doesn't work out, it's it's because we didn't do it right. You know, it's not because you you let us down. And in that way, that sort of calm, uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna be sitting there asking for something else or trying to get something else, um, worrying about each little thing. It's like it's like it, it's a it's a sort of a moral courage. You know, not a battlefield courage, but a moral courage to just say. I accept this responsibility to go forth with what I can. Well, that's right, and I think it's um, inspiring for us, especially during these times. That's all, I, I really do. I've, I've got to say that we have to give West Point a lot of credit for that training too. And in Eisenhower's case, um, he, had, he came from a, a, quite a religious household. Um, they were um, part of a German Mennonite um, Group. They were called. They were the River Brethren. Uh, moved from uh, Pennsylvania to Kansas in the 1870s. Uh, but there was um, a lot of uh, emphasis in that household on personal responsibility and also serving a cause larger than yourself and understanding your place in that hierarchy. And I make a, a fair amount of that in my book because I think this doesn't explain uh, to a lot of people. Uh, who Dwight Eisenhower was. You know, they see him doing what seemed like extraordinary things, but he, he knew where his place was in the hierarchy um, of human life. Um, and when he got to West Point, of course, um, those, um, uh, those values that he learned at home uh, came into full, into full measure because he uh, understood that that higher mission he was going to be serving was the United States of America. If I could just add one thing, um, I think it's really interesting uh, that both uh, Eisenhower and Grant went to West Point for the free education, yeah. and not uh, and and were not never saw themselves necessarily as destined to be soldiers. Um, I want to remind everybody that we're talking to Susan Eisenhower on uh, History Happy Hour, and we invite your questions. And uh, there's one I'm going to put up here from uh, Carolyn Spence Cagle, and she wonders, did Ike suffer any negative health effects from his overwhelming responsibilities and commitment to accountability during the war, during World War II? Well, thank you very much, um, Ms. Cagle. I, I think that's a terrific question. Um, and I would answer it by saying, um, yeah, he had high blood pressure during the war. There's no question about that. Um, but then you would have high blood pressure if he smoked as many cigarettes as he did. You know, he took up smoking um, at West Point. Of course, you weren't supposed to smoke at West Point, but he did that after out of a 
in a state of frustration that he couldn't play football anymore because of a broken knee, et cetera, et cetera. But by the time the war comes around and the sort of pressure he was under, he did, he was probably, we could say, he was a chain smoker. Um, so the thing is, with uh, people with habits like that, you really don't want them to give it up in the middle of a major <laughs> international emergency. Um, so nobody really uh, got on his case about giving it up until... Um, after the war, and then he tried to give it up a couple of times, and then he, uh, the joke in the family was he um, finally gave himself an order <laughs> and went cold turkey. Um, in any case, that smoking um, and probably the stress from the war um, and also this determination, remember, uh, is to be self-disciplined um, and also to project optimism at all times. He really believed that pessimism um, was infectious, especially from the head down. So uh, those kinds of um, bottling uh, this energy and this passion up um, brought him to a heart attack in 1955 and some other health issues. Um, so yeah, I, I would even say that uh, in some ways you could say he gave his life for his country um, mm. because he was so determined not to insult people publicly, um, not to uh, ever be negative around people because, you know, we were trying to accomplish things in his mind and you don't get people to cooperate if you insult them personally publicly. You just don't. You don't humiliate people so that they can never back off. Um, and he believed that it would cause uh, resentment and a desire to get even. And this is something he started during the war and continued into his presidency. So you can imagine by the time the presidency's there, bottling all that stuff up, so if, um, Chris and Rick, if you don't mind me just saying, how did he handle that? Because I think a lot of people are very yeah. interested. You know, you know well, Susan. We, that was my next by, question, actually. By now, I just want to say, we don't mind. If you've got oh, something yeah. else to say. Go. Okay. And if we mind, we'll jump in and say, we, okay, now we mind. So. Okay, all right, we'll say now we mind. Ding, ding, ding. Um, well, so, okay, there we go. See, that's great. All right, well, listen, I, I mean, I, I uh, am trying to use some of this myself, okay? Um, and it's, you know, it's going kind of okay, but he, um, first of all, he's a great diarist. Um, and I, I was a uh, diarist for a very long time. It helped me enormously in making big decisions in my life. You know, not anything of consequence to anybody else, but for me. So he's a great diarist. He blows off a lot of steam there, but he had some other tricks, which I think are absolutely brilliant. If somebody or something really bothered him, but usually somebody, he would write the person's name down on a piece of paper and then crumple it up and put it in his bottom drawer. So I, I keep thinking that this, whoever had to clean out the bottom drawer probably had to have a security clearance. That's what's in the time capsule. That's, that's, it's all in the time, capsule. In the time capsule. Wouldn't that be just great to open the time capsule and find all these people yes. with the same names over and over again? He also, you know, um, my grandmother and, and, uh, specifically said now when you have these problems let them roll off your back now as as um, my grandmother was very sharp she was very funny she was great value but I don't believe she actually came up with that idea all on her own he was um, a master at getting things out of in here and separating them in his head in other words the problem sitting on that couch back there and I can get up and walk back and forth in front of the couch, and it's not in here anymore. Wow. Um, so I guess after all of this, I think that leadership is, um, I guess one of the points I want to make in the book is in Eisenhower's head, leadership is not conveyed on you from the outside. Right. It starts here. And all of the work has to come from here. That's why I think the leadership training is uh, very important, but 10 steps, the 10 step plan is not gonna do it unless you start here. Yeah. Um, and he understood that, um, you know, that he had to be the person who controlled himself before he could uh, lead others. And, you know, I think that's inspiring. For me, it was inspiring because I'm still working on it, but he, he did a pretty good job of mastering it by the end. I would say so. Yeah. Well, you know, so what, you know, it's funny you, you mentioned that because we were talking before the show about when we both went to Normandy for the premiere of Band of Brothers. Um, <laughs> and 
I was, you know, I was really close to a lot of the guys, and we did a show where we talked about Winters. Um, and as I was reading your book about Eisenhower, there were so many of those leadership principles that I'm like, oh yeah, Winters did the exact same thing. You know, right. the preparation, the dedication, the, it, it was almost chapter and verse. Um, and it struck me that there are some things, although there are two entirely different levels in the chain of command, that there are some universals there. Um, well, this is sort of impetuousness, which, um, or short-term thinking. That's the other point I make in my book, which I think is extremely important, is that he didn't, he didn't like off the cuff. He, he didn't do anything off the cuff. Um, you know, he made sure that he had access to um, significant work of study on certain issues. And he remarked that after the war, um, with access and, and a little bit of time, um, you know, he could um, study things at greater length and that there was the luxury to wait a little bit and to let the string pull out uh, because he had access to much more information. During the war, as you know, I mean, you teach this stuff, um, a commander operates with um, very uh, dicey information sometimes. I mean, it's impossible. Uh, to have a full picture of everything because right. the enemy is behaving in ways that are not fully clear, even if we had broken the code. Um, and so that requires a, a lot of instinct, a lot of uh, courage, a lot of guts, a lot of all sorts of things. But in the civilian world, to be making uh, snap judgments based on incomplete information when you actually have the time to do better in gathering that information, uh, I think he would have thought was probably, you know, quasi irresponsible. Yeah. Well, and as you you mentioned, uh, I think in the introduction of your book, there is something that that we've lost in all the, uh, you know, sort of Facebook, Twitter, everything flipping around at high speed. That there, we don't have so much time for, we don't take the time always for reflection and for for kind of acting in that way and i think there is a lot more off the cuff stuff that happens simply because of the the speed of things and people feel somehow like they have to well i also think that everybody thinks that um, activity equals progress and and that everything coming in somehow has to uh, be assigned uh, equal importance to all the other things that's coming in i mean i see people that I have exposure to actually going through every email, even though um, some of them are quite irrelevant to decisions being made, instead of saying, well, you know, so this whole system, and I know General Goodpaster used it and told me that Ike used it, is, is where you have three piles. Uh, one pile um, is for the urgent. Another pile, this is in managing your papers. The other one is uh, one that could bear um, a little more time and study, and another that requires lots more study and is just simply not urgent. And so this would be working on the pile that counts um, on any given day instead of treating them all with some kind of equality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the reason we've sort of given that up is that we feel like we have to respond immediately to things that have actually become very highly personalized um, in our society. Social media has, has done that, but I'm not sure that we're making any really good decisions for the long haul uh, when you think of how many issues um, are still sitting on the table without any attention. Right. Um, I've got my list of the things that I'm thinking about as, as long haul issues, but nobody else seems to be particularly talking about them. Right. So, um, do you want to go ahead, Chris? No, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. So, well, I was going to ask you about something that... Um, in light of uh, some recent news, uh, is quite uh, an interesting uh, historical uh, parallel. Uh, and it's from uh, September uh, 1956. Mm -hmm. And the president, of course, is running for re-election, President Eisenhower. Uh, and there is a vacancy in the Supreme <laughs> Court. Uh, does this sound familiar to anybody? Okay, but this is uh, this is Eisenhower. This is not the current news items. It's a, also a highly divided and partisan Senate at the time, um, and uh, Eisenhower uh, 
kind of surprises everybody with an announcement on, I think, September 29th, 1956, that he is going to make an appointment. And in fact, he appoints a Democrat. He appoints, that's what the headline says right there, if you if you can read it, President Names Jersey Democrat to Supreme Court. Um, uh, William Brennan, who of course becomes one of the leaders of the liberal wing on the Supreme Court for the next 40 years. And this is not some kind of fluke because you write that Eisenhower told his Attorney General, Herbert Brownell, to look for a Democrat because he said the Supreme Court belonged to all the people. So um, what do we learn, what do we take from this parallel in this story? Well, there's. I think there's some fun things about it. I mean, we have now um, uh, a lot of Catholics on the Supreme Court, but at that time it was a pretty radical thing to be looking for um, a Catholic. Um, and then to um, appoint a Democrat, I'm sure the Republican Party wasn't thrilled about that at all. As a matter of fact, uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, voted against this nomination. Um, but I think uh, to understand Eisenhower's actions here, you have to step back just a bit, um, because he really did believe in ideological balance in uh, segments of the government um, where uh, the officials were not elected. And he felt, uh, because he really believed in uh, three co-equal branches of government, um, that the Supreme Court had to be ideologically balanced, or people would lose confidence in their decisions, thinking that they were actually uh, political um, and not based on legal precedent or other legal um, matters. So I, I think that's very, and, and actually Herbert Brownell, his attorney general, sort of said pridefully that by the end of the Eisenhower administration, the federal judges that he appointed were about ideologically balanced. Um, so that's one thing that really reminds you that in a way that was uh, uh, a different time. But just remember, Eisenhower doesn't, uh, nobody even knows what political party he is until just, and just before practically the convention where he gets nominated as a Republican. Um, and he was, as a military man, really about as nonpartisan as, as um, there's ever been in the presidential area. Obviously, George Washington was nonpartisan too. Um, but I think that helps uh, everyone understand why he would feel so strongly about that. So, Rick, um, do you, uh, we have some other questions. You want to pop those in? Or you you want to bring in, we can bring in this question from, uh, from Richard Whalen first. Uh, Ike was president during the Sputnik launch, and he had to hurry the country to meet and exceed Soviet progress in space technology. Did he have any misgivings <laughs> in having Werner von Braun lead? Uh, and I, I, uh, I know that you did, you did include some about the, the space race and, and such in, in the book and that great picture from the Marshall uh, Space Center. But uh, so you could answer the specific question, but your thoughts more broadly as well. Well, I, I, Mr. Whelan, I just uh, love that question because, uh, wow, as we all know, Werner von Braun was not only um, a German, I think he had great Nazi um, sympathies. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that allegedly. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know that uh, um, directly or anything. He didn't else. confide in you? Yeah. Uh, no. He didn't it's in the time capsule. It's in the yeah. time capsule. It's, it's in the time, time capsule. capsule. Yes, indeed. But you know, the, um, the, the proposition that the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States is what we now know to be um, a gross simplification. We could have beat the Soviets into space um, in 1956. Uh, had Eisenhower decided to use military technology instead of technology he had put aside um, for peaceful purposes. Uh, the whole reason for uh, launching artificial satellites in 1957 came um, out of a uh, program called uh, International Geophysical Year uh, that was promoted by the International Scientific Union to, um, to explore the universe, to explore um, unexplored parts of Earth like Antarctica. And so the commitment was to launch an artificial satellite um, that was um, for peaceful purposes. And he just wasn't that, uh, I mean, he was astonished, I think, by how upset everybody eventually became about this. But first of all, he knew about the Jupiter-C program and that we could have gotten into space first. But secondly, 
Um, I think the Eisenhower administration looked at this and said, you know, this is a real um, opportunity because we have yet to establish uh, freedom of access to space. In other words, as opposed to sovereign airspace um, going directly out into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, and the Soviet Union, without um, probably inadvertently, uh, established that precedent um, so that um, by us standing back and, and using a rocket uh, that was going to be um, for peaceful uses only, we reestablished our peaceful intentions for space at the same time, not turning it into a flashpoint that would have been um, yet one more problem with the Soviet Union. Let's not forget the Soviet Union had the opportunity in 1955 to overfly the United States territory, and they refused that, that uh, wonderful opportunity. So they were not likely, once they woke up to the whole thing, not likely to want to see um, freedom of space um, with overflights over their territory, only now from space. Uh, but they were so eager for a little propaganda victory that they were not thinking long enough long term. to understand what they were even doing. This comes back to that long haul thinking. Right? Yeah, it does. And it's a, it's a fascinating period, though. Um, uh, and a fascinating set of issues. So, Rick, do you want to... Oh, I'm wanna... sorry, I didn't mention about Werner von Braun. Um, yeah, except that uh, um, Werner von Braun uh, became very outspoken about Eisenhower and rather bitter that uh, Eisenhower was keeping uh, the federal um, budget, especially in, in military spending, which was our largest discretionary um, line item. Um, and so I, there was tension between them because, um, and with the military in general, because all of them wanted their budgets increased significantly. But uh, what they didn't really bargain for was the President of the United States who knew as much about that issue as they did. <laughs> Do you think there's some crumpled up pieces of paper with Werner von Braun's name in the bottom drawer? I think they put uh, in the time capsule, those are in a red bag, uh, as opposed to the ones that are in the gray or you know, moss green colored bag. Um, uh, Chris, did you want me to bring up the question? This is a question, actually, I'm going to bring up this question, and, and Chris, if you want to add anything to this, um, from Neil, uh, about Ike's relationship with Nixon. Uh, Neil says, my understanding is that it wasn't all that warm. And Chris, did you want to uh, add anything to that question? No, I just, I, I, I just, was, I was curious about it, but I think <coughs> a, a, an observation that Nixon makes, and he says that um, Eisenhower never made an important decision in front of others. He'd go into another room, um, make his decision, and then come back out, which I just thought was an interesting observation. Um, and I haven't come across too many times where I've caught Nixon making reflective moments, you know, thinking about Eisenhower. So it just ties in with Neil's question. Well, yeah, no. First of all, I'm um, I'm I'm sure all of us are grateful to Nixon for actually offering that detail because uh, it goes back to this um, this habit of deliberation. Uh, he just didn't want to be um, found uh, agreeing with the last person who spoke to him. And uh, that's a, a real pitfall that many leaders have, is that um, they get talked out of something they were intending to do. So he knew himself well enough to go to another room and, and think that through. In terms of the warmth of his relationship with Nixon, I think it's uh, worth noting um, that Eisenhower had a very formal relationship with all of his subordinates. And um, people might think that that's um, a coldness or stiffness or something. I don't think he saw it that no. way at all. He, just did not want to um, get palsy with people he had um, very serious um, uh, governance um, relationship with. And um, he had a di completely different group of friends, and those group of friends were not allowed to ask him for anything. I've got some personal stories in that book. I can attest to that firsthand. Um, so Nixon would have been treated much the way uh, Brownell was and other things, very businesslike. Um, as, um, as a matter of fact, Brownell said that we were comrades, not yeah. cronies. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so I don't know whether Nixon himself complained that there wasn't more warmth, but the other thing that we also have to remember is Nixon was young enough to be his son and right. um, had little kids at the time. So um, it just, you know, it, it, I just never uh, thought that 
uh, there was any significance in, in it one way or the other. Um, well, that, it's funny you say that because that was one of the, the similarities between them um, that I saw a lot in Winters. You know, he he had a very close set of friends uh, and then he had subordinates and he respected them and worked with them, et cetera, et cetera. But he understood the chain of command and he said, you know, at the end of the day, I'm in charge and you work for me. And that's what the relationship is. Well, the problem yeah. is, is that um, especially in wartime where um, hundreds of thousands of lives are on the line, um, you don't um, you have to be in a position to fire somebody. Yeah. And, um, and uh, or relieve him of his duties and give him another assignment, but but certainly not to continue in a way that uh, jeopardizes precious resources. And there's no resource more precious than um, right. than the GIs and and yeah. everyone else that's working um, in that sector. So uh, it's not it's not surprising that uh, keeping this distance enables a commander not to be conflicted emotionally. And that's just one less thing that mm -hmm. serves as a burden uh, on making um, sound and forceful decisions. One of the stories that you told in the book involves uh, uh, your father, uh, John Eisenhower, <laughs> being in Korea, coming back for the inauguration, and then wanting to go back to his combat command with his father as president. and. Uh, Ike saying, yes, you can go back, but you cannot allow yourself to be taken hostage, sort of with the meaning being, you know, you may be in a situation where you have to die rather than allow yourself to be taken prisoner. I mean, that's that's a would be a pretty tough command to give to anybody, never mind your own son who has children already. Yeah, I'm, I was one of them. <laughs> no, well, but first of all, uh, Ike does two interesting things there. He makes sure that his son recognizes that he's now commander in chief of all, um, you know, all military forces, etc., and that that is the most important thing. But he gives his son a choice, right? And says that you can, um, you can, you know, work at a desk job. Um, in Washington, uh, because you know, he wasn't forcing him out of the army. My father, by the way, and coincidentally graduated from West Point on D Day and you know, uh, was just at the beginning of his career. Um, and I think it was much more explicit than that. My father was told to carry a handgun with him, uh, to make sure that it was under his pillow at night, practically. I mean, I don't know what you do with your handgun at night since, <laughs> but, um, and, but it was my father's choice, and he wanted to go back to his unit because he didn't think that he could be in the Army if he wasn't, um, you know, uh, fulfilling the obligations he himself had. Um, and some people have read that whole section and thought, wow, what kind of a guy is that and puts, you know, tells his son he's got to commit suicide if, um, you know, the president is put in any kind of position that would jeopardize uh, the conduct of the war. Uh, you know, like through blackmail or something like that. Well, I'd say it's two army officers understanding what duty looks like. Well, it, it, it struck me as, as um, you know, the two things that, the two pillars that you seem to come back to are courage and empathy, and both seem to be on display there because it would take some courage to to send your son back, be willing to let him make the decision to go back, uh, but empathy to say, I'm going to, um, you know, it's courage to tell him what he has to do, but empathy to say, I'm going to let you make the, the choice. We are very near the end of our of our hour, and we have a few questions we haven't gotten to from the audience, and Susan, I, I wonder if it would be okay to email you a couple of those questions, uh, and, and perhaps you could uh, uh, respond to people, and we'll put that up on Facebook. And with that thought in mind, uh, Chris, I will leave it to you to, to post the last question here. All right. So this is the, the big wrap-up question. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I think it's fair to say um, that we as a nation are, are pretty divided right now, um, that there are many people that say even, we'll go so far as to say that we're in crisis. Um, without, you know, getting into the specifics of personalities and policies and whatnot, but given Eisenhower's kind of ability to look into the future and also his ability to walk that middle road that you talk about, what do you think he would say to us? Because there are a lot of uh, people in this country that are, that are very anxious and they're nervous and they're looking for answers. And obviously he, he made some big decisions. So 
without putting you on the spot, what do you think? No, no, uh, you're not putting me on the spot at all. I think there are two things that have happened, which would, you know, he, he would be very concerned about. One is that Americans appear, and this is on both sides of the aisle, so I, I'm saying this in a completely right. nonpartisan way, but both sides, um, the divisions in this country seem to be wrought by the fact that people have lost confidence in our government and, and uh, many of our institutions. Um, and this is already a very serious thing. And we've got to figure out a way uh, to begin to restore that confidence and, and really have some deep thought about uh, what kind of measures uh, we should take. Uh, for instance, uh, on one occasion, one of Vike's vetoes, he had very few of them um, in his presidency, but one of them is he, he vetoed an oil and gas bill because he didn't like the way the thing had been lobbied. I mean, that's really uh, a voice from another uh, era. <laughs> Um, so confidence in government. The, the deep divisions themselves are caused, I think, in large measure by the fact that uh, there's no um, societal penalty for being insulting about other people who don't agree with you. And this is something he'd say has to start here. I keep saying to people, how are you talking to your neighbors who don't agree with you? And how are you talking to your siblings at Thanksgiving? <laughs> um, wow. Uh, that's, that is a question. That's a coming question, isn't it? Um, he also realized that those deep divisions are easily exploitable um, by foreign powers who do not wish us well. And he, he once said that the, the, uh, the deep divisions would be a welcome site for an alert enemy. Um, so next time we go um, uh, blaming uh, the fairly long list of countries who'd like to hack uh, into our systems, I've had my identity stolen by the tw uh, Chinese twice. Um, and, and we know what Russia's behavior has uh, been like around our elections, but I don't think they're the only country by any means. We right. have to say to ourselves, why are we giving them a roadmap? Right. Can't we understand that we, we need to hang together as a country? Uh, and the first way to start that is to be um, better neighbors and, and um, you know, passionate believers in our country where all of this, you know, rise or fall together. Uh, we, we have to hang together, or as was famously Perish. said, we shall all hang separately. Yep. Um, Susan Eisenhower, thank you so much for joining us today. This has just been an inspired hour of conversation, and uh, we've gotten a lot of great positive comments on it. And I want to just mention once again, folks, that Susan Eisenhower is the author of How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest decisions and she joined us from washington dc susan thank you so much thank you well so rick much and chris you. i really appreciate the opportunity and and stephen ambrose was uh, did more for uh bringing excitement to the the study of world war ii and the american presidency so it's been a real honor thank you so much thank you so much Take care. wow Woo. that was fabulous yes it was um, well, you know, on the eighth day, God created Eisenhower. Uh, <laughs> there you go. And it, it all comes on the uh, anniversary of uh, Market Garden and the anniversary of the Ghost Army's Operation Bettenborg. The who? The equally important uh, two operations. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I just want to mention that next week uh, we are going back to the Civil War and we're going to have on author David Welker and he's going to talk about the cornfield. So he argues that the Battle of Antietam is the key battle in the Civil War and that the actions that happen in this one part of the battle, the cornfield, are really the pivotal pivotal place of the Civil War. So we will uh, examine that next week with David Welker. Um, Chris, any final thoughts? God bless everybody. Stay safe and read the book. It's outstanding. Yes. How I glad. Do read yes. it. Thanks so much.